So over the last few weeks, Pastor Matt has been sharing with you the details of our partnership with Carolina Movement. And so just in case you don't know what I'm talking about, in a nutshell, so we as a church, we're going to support these church plants happening in the area. Um, we're going to support them with resources and uh, such as finances and eventually volunteers. Uh, last week, Pastor Matt shared with us the step of faith that Potter Sands took by writing a check going towards this partnership. But then in the same day, God turned around and gave the church back 10 times that amount. And it lined up so perfectly that only God could have done it. So if you didn't have that, hear that story, I encourage you to go back to our YouTube, uh, YouTube channel and check that out. It's kind of towards the end of last week's service. It's a really incredible story. Now, when Pastor Matt first shared with us Potter's Hands partnership with the Carolina Movement, I mean, many of you, he told us, you know, many of you came up, you like gave him a fist bump, you said, hey, I'm all in, I'm ready to go. Whatever you need me to do, you know, I'm going to do it. But it is time, sometimes though, shortly after those moments when we speak up, right, when we step out, and that is, that is when the enemy, Satan, will just come, start coming after you. You know, he starts working us over with these lies, and these lies are directed right at you sometimes. He tells you, you know, you're not good enough. What are you talking about you want to do this, you know? You're not smart enough. Maybe you're not outgoing enough. Maybe you're kind of an introvert. and you do, People kind of scare you a little bit, you know? And he starts working you over with that. Or maybe it's the other side of that coin that he tells you that, you, you know what, you've done enough, right? You've done enough with your life and with the church. You should be perfectly content with everything that you've done with God and done for the church up to this point. You've, you know, you've lived a morally decent life. You paid your tithes. You held doors open for people. Maybe, you know, you, when you're going out to lunch on Sunday mornings and people, somebody cuts you off, you don't use your tall finger or anything. Or, you know, or maybe you tip whenever, you know, the, the service is just kind of subpar, you know. And now you're hearing this voice that it's time to sit back Prop your feet up, you know, bask in the glory of your accomplishments. Or maybe you think, you know, there's really not much else I can do. I've always done this, and there's no way that you could do that. But sometimes we get these little Holy Spirit nudges, these little small voices in your mind, and he talks to us, and he says, you know what, it's time to step out. But we have a tendency to push down those thoughts and those ideas, telling ourselves, well, you know what, maybe I really didn't hear from God. But what if, what if God wants to do something new today with you, something new with this church? And you think about this, who is the church? So we are, right? God is calling us to do something new as a church with this Carolina movement, and we are the church and if we are the church, then it stands to reason that whatever God has in store for you will have a direct effect on what happens at the Potter's Hand Church and in the big church, the, you know, capital C church. So God wants to do a new thing in your life. But what if he's waiting for you to forget the shame or the fears of your past? What if he's waiting for you to not only say, yes, I am ready, but to take that first step for something new and for something different. Today we are going to read about a group of people who desperately needed God to do a new thing in their lives, but they were too hung up on the past to grab hold of the future. So we're going to look, we're going to look at the book of Isaiah. We're going to be in chapter 43, and we're starting in verse 18. And as you are looking that up, we're going to welcome our online guests. Thank you for being with us today. I know some people are sick at home. But thank you for joining us today as well. So we're in Isaiah chapter 43, starting verse 18. And the, I'm going to give you just a little bit of broad context here about what's going on. So the book of Isaiah was written between 739 and 681 B.C. However, the prophet Isaiah was enabled by God to address the Jewish captives in Babylon in the 6th century, around the 500s. So where we are today in Scripture... We see the prophet is looking ahead in time to the Babylonian captivity of Judah, about a century away from this writing. So here, Isaiah's writings to the children of Israel came at a very dark period in their history. They are in captivity. They have lost everything they thought they would keep forever. And they were homesick for the land and the blessing God had promised them. So let's read Isaiah 43, starting in verse 18. 
Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to things of old. Look, I am about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. So maybe that speaks to you already this morning. Maybe you are waiting for God to make a way in your wilderness, a river in your desert. I mean, think about this. Has this past year, has it taken a toll on you, on your family, maybe your finances, maybe some trust or faith, maybe your self-esteem, maybe it's none of those, maybe you're just kind of sick of people, you know? When you see all the stuff that's going online and arguing and the bickering back and forth, you just want to throw your hands up there and say, you know, I am done. I just want to go live in a cabin in the woods and just unplug from everything. You remember, you've probably seen those memes, you know, would you live here and with no internet for, you know, and everybody's like, yeah, I would. No, no you wouldn't. You know, <laughs> you're not going to do that. But maybe you feel like you should, you know. And it's good Christian people that are like duking it out. And not even over theological debates. It's, they're, this is the things that they really true, you know, they don't really know anything about. It's an article a friend shared about the real science and all that. I mean, it really has been insane. So maybe this has caused you to lose faith in some of your Christian friends. There are times that if it wasn't for what I do, in this church, I helped Matt out with some of our Facebook presence and stuff like that. I would be done. I would be done with it because it is so heartbreaking. It really does. It's so heartbreaking to see how we can treat each other sometimes. But we have to remember that even in a year as crazy as this has been, that it's still in the past. It's time for today. It's time to move forward. It's time to be open for a new thing. So how do we do it? So the first step to embracing the new thing that God wants to do in your life is this. He wants you to change your focus, to quit looking behind and start looking ahead. Look at verse 18 again. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to things of old. You know, many years ago when I was in driver's ed, we were riding down this road and I, I grew up in a little small town about 10 miles out. You might not even know where Fayetteville is, but if you do, it's about 10 miles outside of Fayetteville, a little one stop like town. So we're in driver's end, and there's a four lane road that connects it. And this guy's sitting in the front, and he's sitting there, and I'm in the back. And no lie, he's like sitting there, and he goes, You know, he's just looking in the rearview mirror. And he's like, I can keep the car in line, telling the instructor, I can keep the car in line just by looking at the lines in the rearview mirror. You know, so he's not even looking ahead until the guy's like, that's probably not a really good idea. Let's, let's say you no know, focus a little bit on what's ahead. But here's the deal. If you are continually looking behind you, you cannot see where you're going. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? But sometimes we just keep looking behind us. So past things we get hung up on. Look, they're not always negative things. Does anybody remember the Bruce Springsteen song, Glory Days? Anybody? Y'all remember that song? You probably know somebody or maybe even yourself that are still living in the glory days somehow, right? And, you know, if we are ever going to move on to new things in Christ, you must learn that you cannot depend upon past victories to sustain you. You cannot dwell in the past, even when it's something good. We probably shouldn't look back and say, you know, when I was 20, I could go 1 a.m., eat Taco Bell, and I was fine. But now that I'm 48, you know, I can still do that, right? I would be taking shots of baking soda and water all night long if I did that, you know? Or maybe you're like this guy. Anybody know who this is? This is like a deep cut right here. If you, <laughs> this is Uncle Rico from the award-winning movie Napoleon Dynamite. In my heart, it's award-winning movie Napoleon Dynamite. But it is um, Uncle Rico... He got hung up in the past. He blamed all of his failures in his adult life on the coach not putting them in in the fourth quarter so he would, you know, his life would be different. He'd be sitting in a hot tub with his soul meat. You know. That was his whole thing, right? So good memories can do us good. They can when they remind us of God's goodness and faithfulness towards us during those times that we actually need a reminder. But if we dwell on them, if we relish in them in such a way that we cannot move on, to where we are, we are not growing in our relationship with God, they are actually doing us more harm than they are good. Look at the children of Israel. The children of Israel had many victories in their past, leaving Egypt, conquering the land of Canaan, fighting off prospective conquerors, surviving a split in their country, 
But now, as we're seeing, they're in captivity. All the previous victories were doing nothing to set them free. They needed a new work, a new miracle, and a new victory. So if we want God to do something new, we shouldn't be asking ourselves, what has God done? Our questions must be, number one, what is God doing in your life right now? Do you see the fruit of the Holy Spirit working in your life today? Are you presently serving God or the people in your church or your family? Is your relationship with God growing to where you are excited about what is next? And the second thing, what is it that you desire God to do in your life right now? Or what you have to ask yourself, are your desires his desires? Are you more caught up on the dreams that God plants in your heart or the American dream? So let's take a moment. Look at this verse with me. It's Psalm 37, 4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I don't know about you. I have misread that verse for years, right? I made it about me. So let's read this differently, okay? And we're going to focus on God this time. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So what does God give you? He gives you the desires, right? So when we delight in the Lord, God gives. He plants his desires in our hearts. And that is how and when our desires line up with his. I think in our me-centric kind of Christianity, our interpretation of Scripture can get really out of whack sometimes, you know. So ask yourself, what does God do in your life? And what is it that you desire God to do in your life? And those, your desires and his desires should line up. So we cannot live off past victories. And now the next thing we need to understand, if we are going to get anywhere with the spiritual life, is that you cannot live on yesterday's faith. You think about this. The children of Israel had experienced great spiritual blessings throughout their history. From the first Passover, to the crossing of the Red Sea, to the conquering of the land of Canaan, to the building of the temple, the children of Israel had seen the hand of God at work in and through their lives. Yet their faith in what God had done was doing nothing to deliver them from their present situation. Their old faith it was not enough, it wasn't sufficient enough to deliver them from their present problems. They needed a new faith, a new vision of what God could do. They needed a new portion of faith that had brought to pass all the victories from before. Listen, your problems are different now than you were when you were a child. And so all the things you had faith in before are different than they were. When you were younger, you had faith that your little legs would pedal your bike so you could get over to your friend's house. Now, you know, you have faith when you put gas in the car, it's going to get you to work, to beach, maybe church, you know, <laughs> and those kinds of things, right? So we have faith in different things. And it's the same for our Christian walk. You start as a child, but then you continue to grow. And for those of you who have been Christians a long time, hopefully your faith in God has changed and it has gotten stronger over the years. Hopefully you've been challenged more. But through those challenges, your faith grew and you saw the seeds of faith be planted and start producing fruit. But you can't even let yesterday's victories and faith keep you from what God has for you today. Okay, victories and faith. I mean, those are two things that we really look on fondly. Those victories, they produce faith. But let me ask you this. What if they stopped? What if God's last victory in your life was the, your last victory? What if your last moment of faith was the last time that you trusted God? What if you never grew spiritually again and you became stagnant? The Christian life is not a pond, right? It's not a stagnant pond. It's a river it's flowing and getting bigger as it goes towards the ocean. It's ever-growing. It's ever-changing. And if you truly follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, it's never boring. But these positives are not the only thing about our past that can hang us up and that can cause us not to grow. There's another part of your past that we probably, that's probably more obvious and probably a lot, of, you know, a lot of people speak on this, but it still needs to be addressed. You cannot allow your past failures to possess you. Now notice that word possess. It's a very strong word, but it's exactly how it can feel sometimes. Think about this. You know, failures from 30 years ago, 
They can seize our minds and to where we can't feel the exact, we can feel the exact same emotions that we did at that time. You know, the same embarrassment, the same shit, shame, the same filth, but you cannot let past failures possess you. Listen, did you ask for forgiveness? Did you repent? If the answer is yes, then be done with it. Don't listen to the lies that you are no better than your mistakes. Break free from the spiritual bondage of the enemy. He has no power over you. You have to believe that today. You are a child of God. You are always a child of God. The past does not own you. God owns you. God owns you, and you are his. Look, the children of Israel, the children of Israel, they had failed God miserably. Every time he blessed them with good things, they returned him evil things, right? God gave them a temple. They gave him idol worship. God gave them the truth. They lived and proclaimed a lie. God gave them his commandments. They lived like they were just suggestions. That sounds familiar. God gave them wealth. Wealth, they used it to abuse the poor. And God gave them himself. They gave him nothing except rejection. The children of Israel did not deserve to receive anything from God Yet he still loved them, and he earnestly wanted to help them change. And that's a very important word there. He wanted to help them change, not stay the same, not stay in their little bubble that they are in right now. He wanted them to change. Notice God's message again. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to things of old. Look, I am about to do something new. God was not condemning them for their past. They could do nothing to change it. Instead, God was holding out the hand of hope. He is, in fact, saying, forget about your past. I'm giving you an opportunity to repent and start over. Look at what Isaiah writes just a few chapters later. He says this, Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him. And to our God, he will freely forgive. Return to the Lord and he will freely forgive. He is not holding things over your head. If you believe, if you feel like that's what's happening, you are still listening to the lies of Satan. God wants his children to be built up, not torn down. So the first step of embracing the new thing is change your focus. The second step to embracing this new thing that God wants to do for you, do in you and through you, is to clarify your focus. You have to discover what God wants for you. you got to start looking ahead. Start asking God, what now? Right? Read verse 19. Look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? What do you see when you view your life? Do you see problems or possibilities? Notice what God says next. Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, the children of Israel, they had a choice. They could view their past as the prob and the problems of their present, or they could focus upon what God wanted to do in their lives. So we have to ask ourselves, do we see the way, or do, this, do we see the wilderness? Do we see rivers, or do we see a desert? Do we see ourselves as a child of God, or do we see ourselves the way we were in our past? You see, in order, to fought, in order to discover what God wants for you, you must first see yourself as God sees you. The children of Israel felt as though they were getting what they deserved because of the way they had lived. Some even believed that God would never have anything more to do with them, but they were wrong. You may feel like your past has made your life a desert, but in God, your life can become a stream of life. Look at Romans. We're going to look at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now, Romans written by Paul. He was holding the coats for people so they could kill Christians, right? I mean, talking about, you know, before he met Jesus, he was the worst of the worst, right? So look at what Paul says. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. We just sang about that. Free, free, I am free. 
I love how the Message Bible interprets this passage. He says, With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ is like a strong wind that has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Isn't that an awesome message for us this morning? Amen. And look at what Paul writes again in Colossians. He says, it's chapter 1, verses 21. He says, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Look, if you have put your faith in the atoning work of Christ, you have been reconciled and brought into a relationship with God. You are a child of God. And if you are a child of God, then you must keep your heart and your mind and eyes open in order to discover what God wants for you. And now you must see your possibilities as God sees them. Look, he says, I am making a way in the wilderness. He says, God is able to transform the desert areas of your life into fields of blessing and abundance. You can take a dried up, God can take a dried up useless life and transform it into a life of purpose and of grace. Look at what Paul writes again, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 17, now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's that word again, there is freedom. There is freedom. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, and we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is spirit. I love how the message says that. We're going to look at this again. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We are free of it. All of us, nothing between us and God. Our faces are shining, are shining with brightness of his faith. And so we are transfigured, much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually, this is important, our lives are gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become more like him, gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful. Our Christian life is ever-growing and ever-changing, right? So the greatest step to embracing that new thing that God wants to do in your life is this. You have to commit yourself to God's plan. In the story we were looking at as Isaiah, God had already set into motion the events and the people who would lead Israel out of captivity and back into the land of blessing. Think about it. God knew about these events and spoke them through Isaiah years before they had happened. So many years, in fact, that even some modern scholars of the Bible, they have a difficult time believing that Isaiah could have even written the last half of this book. But, you know, I think it's sad when we take the miraculous out of the Bible. You know, we try to put God in this little human-sized mind box that God is beyond our space and time. It, you know, there's no wonder that he could take Isaiah and, say, and, and give him these visions and say, hey, look what I've done. We just cannot keep him in the boxes that we try to put in there. Think about Matt's story from last week. Okay, the same day that the church faithfully sent out money for the Carolina movement, God had put in the mailbox ten times that amount. The wheels had already been put into motion long before we knew what was going on. So we look back at the scripture in Isaiah. Even though God had already set into motion the events and the people who would lead Israel out of captivity, it was still up to them. It was up to them to decide if they wanted what God was offering. If they refused God's plan, if they refused to follow where God was leading, then they would be doomed to remain in their captivity. So let's read that again. Look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. So what does that mean for us today? That God has already set into motion a new direction and a new purpose for your life. God has already set into motion a new direction and a new purpose in your life. So you must answer this question. Will you follow him? God is ready to guide you to what he has planned for your life. Whether you're young, whether you're old, 
no matter where you are in your faith, if you're a new Christian, if you've been a Christian a long time, he still has something planned for you. Okay, so don't get up. You cannot get hung up on your past victories, your past faith. You cannot let your failures of your past possess you. Band, if you'll come on up. So in these next few moments, be bold and ask God what it is that God, that he wants for you. Maybe it will be a general idea of your path over the next few years. Maybe it's going to be something even more specific he's been asking you to do, but you kind of let fear take control of what you're do, willing to do for him. I mean, really, it can be scary, right? God, you know, what would you like for me to do? And sometimes it's even more scary to be specific and immediate, like wake up in the morning and be like, hey, okay, God, what do you want me to do today? And he's like, go talk to your neighbor. And you're like, no, right? It can be scary. He can mess up your plans, you know? So let's, but you got to remember that God's plans for your life they are so much more fulfilling than anything else that you can dream up for yourself. So today, if you hear his voice, you be bold, okay? And you may be like, I don't, how do I tell if I'm really hearing from the Lord today? For first of all, whatever you hear, what do you do? You hold it up to God's word, right? Does it contradict anything in this book? And if the answer is yes then it's not from God. That's why it's so important to read the scripture and it's so important to study it, okay? Because this is our standard, right? Not the, what the world is telling you right now, but this is our standard. But if you believe you are truly hearing from God today, then my challenge for you is to not just say you're going to do it, but to act on it, to do something about it, to take that first step. See what God will do when you open up your heart and mind to the new thing he has for you today.